All right, we're back up in Detroit. As you can see, we're hanging with Brian Wolf. Behind us is Brian's dyno. We love doing the dyno testing stuff here on the Rev and Evan channel. I just got to take a quick second and ask you if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the channel. Always hit that like button and uh, drop a comment. Let us know what you want to see or if you have questions, we love to answer them. So today, Brian, you invite us up again. We always thank you for that. Got a brand new Superflow dyno. Yeah, we, uh, we did the electronics upgrade. So basically the only thing that's left from the old system is the cart, the absorber, and the load cell. Everything else is uh, new and updated. And uh, it was really a great experience. It was uh, not often, do, you, do I say I spent a lot of money and I exceeded expectations, but this time it really did for me. And especially having Superflow technician on site for three days, going through the software, going through how, uh, you know, how to be more efficient with it was super, super helpful. And we learned a few things about uh, some of my testing where I always thought my dyno was a little on the conservative side. And we found out a little bit why that is and what we can do to try to get a more representative uh, uh, data sheet. So before we get into the crazy details about actually making dyno pulls and analyzing the information, I had a couple of questions. A lot of people these days, especially with chassis dynos, have access to dyno numbers. And even with people who don't race a car, people do like to put their car on the dyno. If you just got a blower installed, a twin turbo kit, or even just a cold air uh, that promises X amount of horsepower, the average person can go now and confirm the before and after, spending just at sometimes, you know, just a few minutes on a chassis dyno. So maybe you could explain not all the deep dive differences. But you have chassis dyno, hub dyno, and then you have water brake dyno. So what are the main differences to the average consumer and maybe to the racer? Sure. And, uh, again, I know this is probably where we get a lot of comments. So I'll probably say some stuff wrong about the chassis dyno and the hub dyno because I'm not an expert in those areas at all, though I've used them. But to uh, start with most fundamentally, an engine dyno water brake like we have here is measuring the power at and the torque at the flywheel. When we go to a chassis dyno or a hub dyno, we're measuring the power either at the tire or at the wheel. Uh, hub dyno, uh, you take the wheels off and the plug right into where your wheels bolted on and you're measuring the power there. And for high horsepower cars, really critical, no tire slip. Right. Super, super good uh, way to do it. And in fact, on those hub dynos, you can even like run through a quarter mile simulation. You can shift the car, really cool. Um, chassis dyno, same thing, you're testing the whole vehicle. Now, most chassis dynos are inertia-based, so it's a calculation based on the inertia of the big wheel that the tire is rolling on, on that acceleration of that against the inertia, and it's calculating how much torque it took to accelerate that inertia so quickly. The, the big giant drum that's usually buried in the ground, the vehicle's accelerating that from a roll up to you know peak RPM, and it yeah. measures not only the rate of acceleration, but the mile per hour as well. Yeah, it gets a mile an hour uh, yeah, from, from, that, from, from the velocity of the wheel, but the acceleration was kind of determining the power it took to, to do that. Right. And then on a hub dyno, it's, it's more controlled, and they can actually control the rate at which you uh, uh, accelerate the vehicle. So, um, you, know, two, you know, the hub dyno, kind of the end-all, super good way to do it, other than going to the track. Right. Chassis dyno, you also get the complete vehicle. And the nice thing about both those systems you're testing the entire vehicle. So if you've got a wiring problem, a fuel delivery problem, any of that, you can pick that up before you go to the track. And on a hub dyno, you're eliminating wheel slip, which while you said a high horsepower car versus, because high horsepower cars on a standard dyno jet or chassis dyno can slip the wheels. It's, it's difficult to, to hold those back, yes. Yeah, absolutely. But now going to what we're doing here, and we're gonna be talking about going forward, is a water brake dyno used to measure the output of the engine itself. Right. All the other factors aside. Uh, and again, here, you know, we try to do the best we can to run the wiring system that the customer is going to run on their vehicle. Um, but again, it's not the same as running that complete vehicle uh, on a chassis or a hub. Now, I have one more question for you before we get into some of the heavy details about actually making a dyno pull and analyzing the data. And that would be reasons to dyno a vehicle or an engine? There are, you know, two really, you know, different rationales. When we do the engine, 
you know, basically, you know, engine builders will typically, you know, want to dial their engine before it leaves their shop. They want to know that the integrity is there, that you don't have any leaks, there isn't some unforeseen issue that happens and you don't know it until you actually put power to it. Right. So you want to check the integrity of the engine. Some people like to do a lot of tuning on the dyno. I personally don't because I think it's beating the engine up. And, uh, you, know, you know, tuners like, you know, Jason Lee and Patrick Barnhill will tell me, you know, what you get on the dyno is a lot different than what we get on the car for fuel needs, etc. because the acceleration rates are so different. Right. So uh, from a, you know, if I want to check cam timing, if I want to try different headers, it's going to be a good uh, assessment of that. But to like do to me a, a, a true vehicle calibration, you're just not, it's not the way to do it. It's more to assess the base engine, the integrity of the engine, and fundamental changes in camshaft intake manifolds, headers, stuff like that, on a relative difference on what you're seeing for output. Right. So, and especially if you're, so if you're trying new parts, if you want to test a new cam, a lot easier to do on an engine dyno than a chassis dyno. But on more modern cars, cold air intakes, or if the shop just is going to install an exhaust system for you, you might want to do a before and after. A lot of the newer cars are tuned on the dyno. I see a lot of guys, especially uh, if you're doing a blower installation or a forced induction deal on a newer car, I think uh, you'll put the new tune in and you can validate that really that you're not going to have knock or uh, you want to, on an engine like this, make sure you have oil pressure when you first start it up before you give it to the customer. You know, again, you know, the main thing that we're doing here is checking the integrity, checking where the power is. Um, and again, we'll get into that detail of what the, what is the power the torque um, and what to look for, you know, to know that if you've got maybe a dyno that's reading a little bit conservative or maybe a little bit happy. And again, sometimes it's very hard for the shops like here, we only work on Godzilla's. We we don't kind of set up a lot of expectations on power and you know get the customer too worked up. But there are cases where the customer is looking for a number, and right. it kind of can can lead to things where maybe the number is a little happier than it should be. Um, and uh, I wasn't too worried about the number as far as other than relative differences. But again, having Superflow on site. Uh, Having Brad here, who is a Superflow technician, uh, going through the inertia factor, uh, listening to some of the other guys talk online about, well, how do you know if your if your dyno data is correct on looking at correction factors right. and what makes that up so you have integrity behind the number, you know, made a lot of sense. Then I thought I'd like to share, you know, it'd be good to share that. All right, Brian, let's talk about correction factor and why is it so important when you're analyzing the data? Sure, yeah, correction factor is, you know, First, let's talk about what it is, right? So there's a couple different correction factors that are used very commonly. Engine builders like myself or Chris Holbrook or Tony Bischoff or Anthony DeSoma will all correct to standard temperature and pressure. Um, when a manufacturer like Ford Motor Company uh, advertises power, it's J1349. Those two are corrected to two different atmospheric conditions and it's about four and a half percent difference just in that correction factor between right. the barometer, the temperature, and the humidity that they correct to. So when you have uh, correction factors and you correct to that same level all the time, you're adjusting for what's happening in the atmosphere as you're testing the engine. So on some days, it might be a barometer might be very, very low, the temperature might be high, and the engine is actually making less power. Right. But you may change nothing, and then you run the engine again on a day with a high barometer and cooler air, and it made a bunch more power, but it's only due to the density of the air going into the engine. All right, Brian, so the average guy gets his engine built or takes his car to the chassis dyno, and you get that dyno sheet, and you're looking at it, and a lot of times you're either really happy or really sad because the number is either meeting your expectation or you're kind of like, wow, I thought my engine or my car would make more power. So let's talk about the things that actually affect those numbers, correction factor, weather, um, and the dyno itself. Sure. So there, there's two big factors when you look at a dyno sheet. You know, typically, we always look at the corrected power. That's what's presented to the customer. What did the engine make? Right. And then, you know, engine builders, we look at what's called corrected to standard temperature and pressure or the old J SAE J607 correction factors, which, if memory serves me right, are 2992 barometer, 
dry air and 60 degree Fahrenheit air going into the engine. Um, now, when a manufacturer rates an engine, they rate it to the new test procedure, which is J1349, which actually is a lower barometer, a warmer temperature, and it actually is about 4.5% difference just in the correction factor alone. That being said, when you go to an outside engine shop, we're all using standard temperature and pressure. And what that allows us to do is as the environment is changing, barometer, temperature, and humidity, it allows us to bring that in those the engine output back to a common set of air environmental conditions that make up air density that allows the engine to make power. That's so, correct. And to be uh, open on correction factor, Evan, you mentioned this when we were talking about the video before you, you got here. It's like, how cool would it be if I could correct my ET of my quarter mile to, you know, um, a 60 degree a day at uh, sea level all the right. time? You know, it's, it's, it would be a standard. But when we go to the track, we don't have that luxury. We have to run in the weather we have. And some days we run really quick on a nice, cool day in the fall. Or we right. don't run so quick on a uh, warm day in the middle of summer. You yes. live on the East Coast or here in Michigan, and you get to run in, in, uh, in the colder months at sea level tracks. You got those hero conditions. But let's say you live in Denver or you just live at a track that's, uh, you know, 1,000 feet or 2,000 feet up you may never see as good a conditions as you might at some other track. And you'd always be curious, like, what would my car run at Atco or uh, one of those type tracks? Yep, so you dream of going there one day in the fall and running really fast. But um, the other thing, so to look at on the dyno, so on the dyno sheet, there's two things. One is a correction factor. The other thing that I kind of overlook to be, you know, fully transparent is when I, you know, started work on the Godzillas, I took a stock engine, I baselined it with the dyno headers, Right. which on a stock engine were pretty close to um, the stock exhaust manifolds, and that was about 508, 509 horsepower. Okay. When I put this same, uh, a stock engine with same uh, exhaust headers uh, on this dyno, I got about 509. But with, when Superflow was here, they said, well, you know, that's with no inertia factor it, uh, put in. I go, you know, tell me more. I said, I've heard the term. I've heard people talk about it and how it can be used to change the output that I see on my dial sheet. Right. But I've never really worried about it because I always kept it constant. And what we did was we took uh, a stock engine, we held it at steady state at 5,200 RPM, and we observed the power. And it was about 520. But yet on my 300 RPM per second sweep, it was about 508. Right? So there was, there was quite a difference. Quite a difference. And I've heard of other people you know, recording baselines of about five. 15 to 520 something. So I said, well, you know, maybe, you know, I always thought my dyno was conservative, so it must have been, well, they were smart enough to put that inertia factor in and calibrate right. it, which is what we did when Superflow was here. So the, what that inertia factor does is, you know, as you're accelerating the engine, it takes output away from the flywheel as you're accelerating everything inside the engine. So you've also heard if I put like an aluminum flywheel on the car, or I put light, you know, aluminum rods and lightweight right. pistons, it's going to rev quicker, and that's because there's less inertia to overcome. So we calibrate that. And, you know, again, for me, since it's all Godzilla's I do, and all the bob weights are about the same and the valve trains are very similar, you know, I was able to get an inertia factor that I'm pretty comfortable with. But it did change my baseline about 10 horsepower. Um, and uh, even though the relative difference when I started to run different cams and intakes, that looked very similar Right. But the absolute number, I was probably a bit conservative and having, you know, Superflow here on site and going through that calibration exercise with me was very helpful and also helped me understand uh, why maybe my numbers were a little lower than other people's. Uh, so that's the other thing. So when you look at a dyno sheet, um, I encourage people uh, to look at, to ask the, you know, engine shop or whoever dynoed it, you know, I'd, hey, I'd like to see what the correction factor is made up to. What was the Brom? Like on the sheets we publish now, we have barometer, we have air inlet temperature into the engine, right. and we have humidity. And then we have the standard temperature and pressure correction factor right on the dyno sheet so the customer can see that. And then, you know, if there's any questions, like, geez, you know, I've got a 7% correction. Well, you know, the barometer was 2910 that day. We had 90 right. degree air going in the engine because it was hot out. And, you know, this, this is, uh, and the humidity was, you know, 42%. And you can see it right there. Um, but it also is a flag. Like if you see, you know, something super high, like 140 or 150 degree air inlet temp, you know that air, in temp, that 
air temperature sensor probably wasn't measuring the air going into the engine. It might have picked right. up something else in the room in air. So it's always good to ask for that information on your dyno. Is that because it generally shouldn't be that hot in the dyno cell? Yeah, you shouldn't be pulling in 140 degree air uh, in, in, in most dyno cells. I mean, you know, you're, you're normally pulling in outside air uh, right. into the dyno cell. And then the other thing to ask them is, does this include an inertia correction factor or not? And if it does have an inertia correction factor, what is that? Right. And, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, and if, if, you, if you may be hearing some hemming and hawing, it might have been, you know, the, a number that, you know, maybe was a little bit unreasonably high for the combination. To generalize a little bit, you can assume if you dyno test your engine or your car on a super hot summer day, it's going to correct up. It's going to give you some mm -hmm. factor back. If you bring your car to a shop in December in uh, New England or here in Michigan, it should be correcting down unless, like you said, shops like the NASCAR shops or Ford Motor Company go into that a little bit because they can actually control the weather even down to the barometer, the barometric pressure in the dyno cell, correct? Yeah, Ford, uh, you know, again, I'm not as familiar with what the NASCAR shops have today, but like Ford, you know, when I was there, we had a critical air system. So you're controlling the temperature, pressure, and I, we could even control the grains or the humidity in the air. So you're really able to get better repeatability. Because one thing I do want to say, correction factor, while it's very good and it's uh, something that you need to do, it also is an empirical uh, set of equations. In other words, it was from a lot of data, data gathered uh, to come up with the correction factors right. as opposed to, you know, a, a first order principle uh, uh, effect. So that's why Ford, you know, and, you know, I'm sure Chrysler and GM and Toyota and all of them are about the same where they have those critical error systems to try to get that repeatability. Right. And when you, you know, when you see a number like the Shelby GT500 makes 760 horsepower, that's also with the air inlet, with um, catalytic converters, right? The, the, the standard that you mentioned for Ford and that the uh, other OEs use, tell us more about what's going on there. Yeah, so J1349, uh, which is what um, the OEs uh, correct and the procedure that they run their engines to, you know, demand that you have a exhaust system that, represents, that has representative back pressure. Uh, that you run the air induction system, and it also requires that the VAT is on. Alternator turning but not charging. Um, so that is a, pr a, a pretty realistic what you're going to get on going down the road right. with that. Not at the wheels, but at the end of the crankshaft. So it's a, uh, and, and when we, a good case in point, like the Godzilla in the pickup trucks right at 435 horsepower. Right. But yet I measured, as I mentioned, just under 520. Well, you start to go into that. Well, when we measure it here, you had dyno headers, no back pressure, no air cleaner on it. We, on a good system, you know, that could be as much as 10 to 14 percent power loss for those two factors. Sure. Then you add the four and a half percent difference in correction factor. Then I, we run an electric water pump. They're turning the water pump. That's probably five to eight horsepower. Uh, then on top of it, we're running 93 octane fuel uh, at MBT Spark, where they have to run knock limited spark uh, in the engines, which has a lot bigger effect on the bottom part of the torque curve than near the peak power. Okay. But uh, those all, all add up, and you know you can walk that, you know, 435 to over 500 pretty pretty easily. So Brian, you're about to go to a an engine shop or a chassis dyno. Are there questions that you should ask the operator? In, even And I know you said you weren't an expert on the chassis dyno, but I would imagine even things like how the car is loaded on the dyno and how tight it's strapped down would have an effect on, on, that, on the numbers in the end. Yeah, they very well could. And to be open, I don't even, can't speak to you know, how much difference it would make if it's torqued down with more strap load than is needed. Um, but one of the things I can say is when you go to the, when you're going for the number, and you're observing what the engine's going to run. I would say don't go in and with with you know telling the guy, boy, it better make you know 780 horsepower. I'm going to be really right. disappointed, or you know, because what you're doing is you know you're you're sending a, a message that may lead someone to try to give you the number you want, which might be a little bit on the happy side. So I think 
you know, the best approach to go in is saying, hey, when I get the dyno sheet, I'd really like to understand what the barometer was, the humidity in their right. air and lung temperatures. I'd like to understand if you're using a inertia correction factor and, you know, what this engine produces is what it produces. I'm going to be happy with it. I really want is the truth. Don't shoot me a number that makes me happy. Um, what you really want to do is get the, you know, you want to make sure that, well, you know, the air inlet temperature sensor is really measuring the temperature of the air going in, not maybe a hot environment around the right. air system, or maybe dialing up that uh, inertia factor. What you really want is, you know, the accurate number. And the thing is where it becomes difficult, like if you're a racer and you go to one shop and boy, it's down, you know, 15 horsepower from last year, but the car went quicker. Are you happy or sad? Right. You're, you're happy. What matters is how quick it goes on the track. Now, there's a lot of people that get engines built that never go to the track, right? They've got a show car, they've got a street car, and they want the number so they can brag, you know, to their friends about how much it made. And, you know, unfortunately, um, those are sometimes, the, you know, the toughest, you know, customers right. because they'll never know. I mean, if it made, you know, 900 or 970, they're never going to know if they don't, you know, really go to the track. And... Um, it, it could those pressures or leading for the wrong expectations, you know, to me are just detrimental. All right, Brian, thank you so much for your time on this. I know uh, we got into some heavy duty stuff, some heavy duty talk about dinos and sheets. If you like this kind of stuff, drop a comment, let us know. If you want to see more stuff or if you got questions for Brian, please let us know in the comments section. Don't forget to subscribe. And we appreciate everybody checking out the Rev and Evan channel.